Ah, uh, yeah. all right. So, so, so let me make sure I'm following this. So McCall, it was a 20, $22 million buyout. They needed $1 million in cash. He got 500000 from the bank. Yeah. Okay. And Mrs. Lewis, too, if you could walk. So McCall at that point, what was the business exactly? What, what was McCall doing? Patterns to women who sold. Okay. So the 113 years history of McCall, in the three years that Mr. Lewis managed it, they had the highest income. Ah, I love it. So he's managing this company. He's introducing new products. Revenue shoots up. Income shoots up. Yes. All right. This is good. This is good. So he's now running. And what's the revenue uh, or, or uh, the revenue and valuation of, of McCall at this point? I, you know, I don't know. But Crothers, a, a, a company in, uh, in, in London, made a bid to buy it for $65 million. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Okay. All right. So whatever is the income or net income times a multiple, they valued it at $65 million. He bought it for twenty two. All borrowed money. Look at that. And and he paid immediately the five hundred thousand from JP Morgan. He bought. He refinanced. He refinanced the company. Refinance meaning, you know, you have a borrowing from the bank. You want you refinance it because the income has grown up, and therefore you can pay more. He refinanced yes. the company and bucketed some more. Okay. Yes. That time he had eight eight percent. The other twenty two percent, twelve. Twelve. Twelve percent. Twelve percent was divided with his CEO and his CFO and two board of director members. Who are they? Some people, he put in $10. <laughs> Not bad. And uh, Rick, Rick Olivares. Okay. You know, he put in $5. You, you pretend that you are not the owner. That's what Mr. Lewis did. Wait, 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 okay, wait, help, help me understand. You pretend that you're not the owner. So when he was asking for money, when he was going from, you know, for, for the bank, you know, you have to make a case of why you're borrowing 22 million. All right. He didn't say that I am the main shareholder. I have shareholders. I see. So truthfully say, he's got a white guy and he's got a Latino guy. So he's not the only one. Ah, so strategically... He places these people on the board so that it doesn't appear as if he is the only. Okay, I understand. In the game, he decided on the basis of race. I see it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. He's playing the game. I like it. So then he eventually sells McCall. Right to to Crothers. Oh, so he took that offer. The six dollars. Three dollars. Yeah, the three dollars in three years. He said, "Time to sell." Because he has increased the income, you know, he has increased and he and he was able to find a buyer for sixty-five million. Now, what? Why did he say in the New York Times after he sold it ninety to one return? Why? Because he refinanced it, so that's money in his pocket. He was paid a million dollars for three years, money in the pocket. So all in all, the one million brought him ninety million. Ninety million. He made ninety million dollars in, three, in years. three years. Yes. <laughs> okay, I see what you're doing, Mister Lewis. Oh, okay. So ninety million in three, which wasn't any of his money. So he really made ninety million from from, from everyone else's money. Then what does he do? His friend in the Mike Milken told him they're selling Beatrice International Foods. 64 companies in 10 to 1 countries. So you have to bid in an auction. Who has okay. the highest auction? And so at that time, Cliff Christoph and him were now, he said, Cliff, come over here. Let us buy this company because both of them have been doing that. They asked Mr. Lewis to put up 15 million mm. because he just sold a call. Exactly. 15 million. And they demanded that 25% be part of Drexel Burnham, mm. okay? okay? So And the others sold to others, but Mr. Lewis was very insistent, I get majority control, Okay. all right? So for 15 million, he got majority control. I think his bid was 175. Just to be sure, he added another 10, 
<laughs> sure, you know how investment bankers will say, well, I'm not sure, you know. <laughs> so he had that $985 million. $985 million. He has to put up $15 million of his own money. And this is, I think what people need to understand is this is massive risk because his assumption is that after he purchases the company, he can add new products, so increase revenue, or he can figure out how to cut cost in some way. So this, this, is, this is massive risk for him to take, but he takes the risk. That's the leverage buy-up of the 1980s. The mind-blowing part to me, though, is that he gets the job done, right? And when he gets the job done, he then changes the name to TLC Beatrice. At this time, I, I think I'm still like too young to understand business, but, you know, at this point. But what's going on? Because here is now a black man from Baltimore who rises up the ranks, largest leverage buyout at that time, first black man to now run a billion dollar company in the world. Was news media picking this up at that point? Well, what, how, how was the, everyone reacting? In August, in August, when it came out, okay, it broke everyone because nobody knew him. Who is this Reginald Lewis? I mean, in the black community, it's like President Obama becoming president. I mean, yes. what? You know, so it broke. It, it was in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, not front page, okay? Not front page, but it was in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Business Week. You know, it hit, it hit the papers. And of course, in the black community. And at that time, just to connect it back to his dream as a little boy, at that time, what would you say? Because I've heard various quotes around what the net worth was that I don't ac actually think is, is, is accurate. And I know you don't probably want to talk in detail about money, but roughly, what was it? Well, roughly. Forbes, Forbes said it. Forbes said it, 400 million in 1992. But Forbes said he's 400 richest people. He was one of them. And they valued his worth, net worth, as 400 million. 400, 400 million. 400. So 1992, net worth of 400 million, which puts him among the 400 really richest people in the world at this point, right? In 1992. That was his dream. What was he thinking in 92? And also at this point, I, I need to ask at what point does he find out that? he's sick. It must be right around the corner from 92 that he finds out. End of 92. The end of 92. What a year 92 was. What a year. So he's reached the height of his career. He's reached the dream that he's always wanted to attain since he was a little boy, right? Unbelievable. One of the wealthiest men in the world. And then in 90, 1992, he finds out that he has an illness. I'm assuming at that point, he did everything humanly possible to fight. Everything. Everything. Including, including what I thought might help. I've heard in the Philippines of this man who is able to cure cancer. So we flew him over here. Even that. Wow. Wow. Help us to understand his mind. Because he strikes me to be this ferocious fighter that feels through life that nothing is in, insurmountable. He, he can overcome anything. But then he hears that he, that he has cancer. What's going on in his mind in terms of his, his perspective? Okay, first, they, what are the doctors saying? Chemotherapy, radiation. But okay. he asked the question, will it cure me? No, it won't. So he made the decision, no chemotherapy, no radiation. Wow. Okay, so how did he find out by... Around Christmas, we moved to our duplex on Fifth Avenue because they always said we have to live on Fifth Avenue. So we moved there, and by Christmas, he knew that something was wrong. And by the new year, there was a biopsy. But, okay. Just to be sure. And so by the new year, we knew that it was lymphoma. So he took his salary of five years, he took his 
finder's fee, they did not want to give it to him. That really just made him so mad. You know, everybody else get the finder's fee and I won't get it. That's $7 million. So in 1991, he took that all. 1992, and then 1992, he discovered that he had cancer in the brain. And by January 19, he died. Incredibly quick. Now, when something like that happens to anyone, it's devastating to the family, to friends, to the company, etc. But I think there's an extra layer of devastation when it happens to someone who's so important in the community, right? What I understand, though, is upon his passing, did you then take the helm of the company? No, no. You did not. No, I was too devastated. I could not even think. I could not even talk. I could not even, you know, because it was so fast. And, you know, as a woman of faith, I thought that a miracle would happen. That if you ask God with sincerity, that he would, you know, God would answer. And then he just died. I was catatonic. No. And also, you know, I'm a good wife. He never gave instruction after me, you read succeed. So it's not even in my mind. No, 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 no. I was I really, really, really. Joe Biden had said it. He said, when something like that happens, it's like a hole in your chest, a hole in your heart, and you really cannot fill it up. And that's what I felt. And also, Mr. Lewis had said, Vice Chairman Gene Fugit. Okay, so he succeeded as chairman, automatic. So that's what he wanted. So it was right. never in my mind to take over. No, 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 no. That's not in the plan. That's not in the plan. So Mr. Lewis, he, he passes. One of the questions that I have, the company itself is still a, fa it's still a family company, correct? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a family company in the sense that we have 51%. But, you know, we have shareholders. Because when you raise one billion, the shareholders either lend it to you or they invest as an investor if they think we're going to make to be successful. You know, we only have 51%. 51% means we determine who are the board of directors. Right. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah, yeah, essentially. Essentially. But at some point, though, from what I understand is you then led the company. I think this is important. Because what I've noticed in world-class performers is that there's not only a romantic relationship between the spouses, but there's a business relationship. There's an understanding of how business is, is exacted. I think there's a notion that many spouses, that if it's the man running the company, that he may not share with his wife the inner workings of what's happening in the company or even vice versa. It's the woman running the company. She may not share with what's happening uh, with her spouse. But in the six more successful scenarios, there's an exchange of ideas in what's happening. So is what I'm understanding correct in that as Mr. Lewis was leading the charge in the company, he was sharing with you what was happening, sharing with you the vision. You were there. You were on the road, on the plane, flying around all around Europe, selling off these companies so that when the time came for you to step into the role, you were ready. Nope. No. No. no, 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 no. Look, everything you said, Paul, was wrong. <laughs> so what happened? I was, Tell me. I was a corporate wife. I listen. I listen. But I wasn't there when he would go to Spain, to Ireland, to Thailand, to Japan. I mean, I wasn't there. I was corporate wife. I knew nothing about the business except he tells me, you know, he tells me and I listen. But what made me decide? Because we started to interview CEOs, you know, because my husband did choose Gene Fugit, but only temporarily. And I will always be grateful to him. But, you know, because I am the majority shareholder, we decided we will meet, you know, once a week, what, twice a month to discuss whatever. And I see slowly that he was a very good second in command, meaning to say my husband always consulted him and all that. But sometimes there are places, there are situations, you're a very good second in command, but you not become a general. 
business was falling down. So we started to interview CEOs and CFOs. For me, okay, fine, you are, yes. But they were all white. Not that I'm against any white man, but it is known as the black company. We were all asking a lot of money. Okay, fine. But the worst is you ask a lot of money, you're a white man, but you cannot give me an assurance that it will succeed. We will try our best. I will try my best. And after prayer on December 22nd, I knew it was very clear. God's promptings take over. Wow. And, and so so then, just so everyone knows, so then what, what was... What was the next chapter of TLC Beatriz's life, the next chapter of, of the company? So I always knew, my husband always says, okay, create value and then sell. So your role, when you took over, your role was then to continue with that idea of, let me continue to break out these no, parts. No, no, no. Because okay. we were down. We were down. Our income was down. But you know, my father is an entrepreneur. My mother is an entrepreneur. And it's also common sense. When your income is down and your expenses is up, it's common sense. You have to reduce expenses. Absolutely. So that's what I did. First thing, sell the corporate jet because it's $3 million a year just to maintain it. Mm. Okay? Mm. Second thing, we are on the 30, 42nd floor of 9 West 57, you know, the solo building, you know, overlooking Central Park. Oh, my goodness. Okay. What is the rent for that? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So we gave that up, but we negotiated with Solo. We will occupy on the, on the 39th floor only 7,000 square feet from 32,000 square feet. Okay, 7,000. And then there, the plane, I have to let go 50% of our corporate staff. People who have worked for Mr. Lewis for many years, his secretary, Deirdre Wilson. You know, Faye and uh, Norma, I have to let them go. All of his executives that he chose, all right, I have to let them go, except one who is the operating officer, because he knew he has been there even with the Beatrice, you know, with the old one. He's been there 18 years. Then it's Joe. I had to keep him, but all the rest had to go. But I gave them very generous separation pay. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm sure you, you took care of them. But I can imagine how I actually I can't imagine I can't put myself in your shoes because you were looking for CEOs. You then decided you could do it and you're now running a company, but you're also trying to think about the vision of your husband at the same time. And you're met with an unprecedented economic downturn at the same time. So it's incredibly challenging, incredibly challenging. All right. You know what I have to ask? One part of this story that we didn't get to is the relationship between you and Mr. Lewis, right? You and Reginald Lewis, or Reggie, as I understand some people would call him. No, 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 no. No? no? Family can call him Reggie. Oh, okay, only family. <laughs> there you go. I'm his not even friends, going there. I'm going there. His friends would call him Reg. His friends would call him Reg. Reg. Ah. Yeah, board of directors, all of his friends, Reg. Reg. Interesting. Interesting. So walk me back to the blind date. And when I say to the blind date is that here's, here's really what I want to ask you. I want to go, I want to go all the way in on this is that there are a lot of women who watch and listen to the better with Paul podcast and they're single, but they're interested in not just any man. They want a highly ambitious, great, talking, smooth, dresser, good looking. They basically want a Reginald Lewis of modern times. This is what they want. So I want you to give us the masterclass on how do you lock down a Reginald Lewis and get him to focus only on you, marry you, and stay married to you. How do you do it? How do you do it? Actually, I wasn't intending to marry anybody. <laughs> no, 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 no. When I was second year college, I mean, second year law school, you know, I was raised in a Catholic school, high school, Benedictine nuns, German nuns. My um, education was Catholic, all girls school, Belgian nuns. All right. And so the spirit of service was in me. It seems like a good life. So I was going to enter the convent. I had already a date, July 4. But my mother said, Loida, you are already 
two years more, you're a lawyer. So finish it, take the bar. Then you don't have to worry because the merchandise is in your head. You can go anywhere. You can go and make, become a nun. You will get out of the nun, whatever. You get married, you don't get married. Your merchandise is in your head. And I thought that made sense. Okay, fine. My, my life is set. I'm going to public service. You know, my father had always dreamed that I would become either congressman, maybe all the way to senator. Okay, fine. Then I come to the United States. And then I meet this man, Reginald Lewis. I thought I was driven. He was more driven. I thought I was ambitious. He was more ambitious. I thought I was hard charging. He was more, you know, a type A. He's triple A. <laughs> so, you know, surrender. I surrender. But it didn't happen immediately because, as I said, you know, I never had a boyfriend. I'm going to be a nun. And so I meet this man. First day, first blind day. Ooh, Wow, we were, you know, in sync. So one week later, he invited me, just me and him. Okay. And then wonderful, wonderful set conversation. And uh, we, we ate in Greenwich Village. And then before we ended, he said, would you like to see my, my the watercolor in my apartment? Why? Because he did tell me that second year in law school, there was a charter flight to Paris. And Paris was like, his place because his grandfather was always talking about Paris. You know how the French were not racist, accepted them, you know, as human. So go on, $200 back and forth. So he went to Paris and he met this Danish guy who was a watercolor. And, they, and he said in Paris, he had no money. He stayed in my hotel. And when I went to Amsterdam, he will stay in London. And all of the, on over the walls were his watercolor. Very good. Oh, wow, so watercolor. So he said, why don't you, I will sell it in the coop in Harvard. Harvard University. And, you know, the Harvard coop, co-op. And that happened. And so he said, would you like to see this watercolor that I got from Elga? I said, sure. All really? Right. Oh, no, no. Now I want to say, Mrs. Lewis, that sounds like a, a line, though, to get you back to his place. You know, would you like to come back to my place and see my watercolors? As I told you, I was green. <laughs> <laughs> I never had a boyfriend. Okay, okay. Good. Okay, I'm going there. All right. Okay, there. There, there it was. Railroad apartment. His, his uh, railroad meaning when you enter on one, it's a railroad. On one side is that supposed to be bedroom, but it is just a little study. So it's a study. The bathroom. And when you enter to the living room, that's where he had his bed, double bed, a, a sofa and a, uh, a love seat, and that table of all his recording, his, his turntable. Oh, interesting. Uh, records. Record, his, uh, you know, the speaker, etc. Okay. And so they were there. We were seated. Then we started to become intimate. Oh, no. I don't, I don't know if I want to hear this. Oh, no. No. <laughs> Oh my God, I was so scared. I was so scared. So he did, the gentleman that he is, you know, brought me home, brought me to the hotel because my mother, my sister, and I were in the hotel room with, you know, cooking facilities. Okay. okay. Oh God, I was so scared. So that night I wrote him a letter. Dear Reggie, all right, I had a wonderful time with you, but I will not be intimate with a man, only with the man that I will marry. But I will always remember you with fond memories. Wow. So that's it. I never want to see you again, you know? I never want to see you again. No, 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 of course not. All right, so here we go again. I'm working, you know, et cetera, et cetera. One week later, he calls me again. Oh my God, he didn't get my letter. So I went out with him again. We had a nice time. Really? Did All you right. talk about the letter or no? No, no, no. I didn't talk about the letter. Just, you know, he didn't get it. Why would you call me? I told him, don't call me again. Okay, we were going in the hotel before we went in. He said, you know what? I wrote you a letter. Yes. Yes? You got it? Yes. But I told you, don't call me again. Loida, I'll never do anything you don't want me to do. Mm. Mm. <laughs> okay. He was right. He was right. He was right. All right. Okay, good. I like it smooth. He's smooth. Smooth. Yes, uh, that's right. 
whatever you, you know, I won't do anything. So I'm a gentleman. And so I started going out with him. Okay. Officially. Officially. Yeah. Officially, yes. So we began. Always, always a good time. But one thing though, you know, you know, I'm the one always making plans. And now he makes the plans. And if I'm late, he gets angry. And I'm always late. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's almost like somebody who knows how to pay me. So Christmas time, we were, he invited me again. And we were at the Riverboat. That is the restaurant on the Empire State Building down there. He said, well, Count Basie is playing. Count Basie. Yeah. Wow. Yes. 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 So we were there dancing, enjoying. And then I said, you know, we should not see each other again. I said, why? I'm, I'm, I'm going to fall in love with you. You're going to fall in love with I, I will just break my heart and break your heart. He said, I'm going back to Manila. He said, how do you know? How do I know? That's true. How do I know? So he convinced me again. Yes. How do I know? How do I know? Let it play. Go with the flow. All right? So go with the flow. Oh, my God. And so we became a pair. Okay? But he would always bring me back to the hotel. And slowly I got to understand his moods, you know, his temper. Yes. Everything. But he was masterful. And so I surrendered. <laughs> oh, you surrendered to the love. To the love. <laughs> You know, I met my match. I met my match. So how is it that you two then got engaged? Because I've heard a story here. I've heard a story. Okay. So, okay, January, February, March, April. Okay. So, you know, we're very intimate. We like each other. We're, we're in sync. So what else is next? Marriage. Yes. So he was bringing me on the subway. To the hotel, so and there's not too many, not too many people. So I said, "Darling, do you want a big wedding or a small wedding?" And he answered, "A small wedding." Where do you think we should have it? At the NYU University, they have a nice chapel. And then he just understood what happened. Oh, I have a headache. <laughs> <laughs> I kissed him on the cheek because I knew I got him. <laughs> you you proposed to him. I proposed to him. <laughs> And he said yes. <laughs> and then when he realized what it was, he had a headache. <laughs> wow. I knew it. I knew it. So I kissed him. I kissed him on the cheek. Darling, you know. So and, the, and that was that. We're getting married. We're getting married. So Memorial Day weekend, my classmate from St. Teresa's, oh, they all came ahead of me. All right. They all had boyfriends. Okay. And my sister was boyfriend, my boss. And so at Memorial Day weekend, we were together and, and you know, Reginald and St. Jones, the Jones Beach. We have an announcement to make. So everybody was looking. And Reginald Sewis said, Lloyd and I are getting married. Silence. Silence. Why? Because I just arrived. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> arrived. Here they are. They have been around for, you know, two, three years. Have a boyfriend. You know, they're sleeping together and all that. And I'm getting married. You're getting married. Exactly. And they, they're upset. I'm sure they're upset. They were upset. That's why you do silence. Silence. And then it was my sister who brought, Lloyd, congratulations. And, and, and everybody gets congratulations. Okay. Great. 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 But that's not the end of the story. By June, Melly, my sister, is finished her college. My father was sending us abroad, I mean, to Europe to just investigate the furniture or, you know, whatever it was that he wanted us to investigate. And then... I had a second thought. What does it mean now that I'm getting married? It means I will leave the Philippines. I will leave my family. I will leave my friends. I will leave my ambition. No more, no more Senate. No more running for office. I said, I can't go through with it. So when we came back from Europe, I called him. I can't go through with this. I'm going back home. Wow. Yes. You, so you broke up? I broke up. I broke up. I broke up. It was it was my mom who told me that, you know, Mr. Lewis called her. We're not getting married. She's going back to the Philippines. And mom, that's why I love her, called the hotel to call me, to tell me, don't do that or whatever. But I, we had already left. So you left, you went back to the Philippines. I was going back to the Philippines. But you know what? On the plane, I was so sad. 
I was so, so sad that I will never see somebody like him again. And John Hill is very perceptive. I was not talking. I was not you know, doing, you know, I, was, I was not with them. Yes. Hilda, if you're that depressed, why don't you just call him? <gasps> never thought of that. Darling, I'm coming back. Wow. Yes, that's what happened. Of course, I didn't come back because he said, Loida, you're already on your way to the Philippines. Go tell your parents, come back here. I'll make all the arrangements, you know, an NYU chapel, and then we go to Paris. That's where our honeymoon will be. <laughs> so in two months, in the heat of summer of July and August, because we're going to be get married on August 16th, all right? He stayed. He stayed single, you know, no girlfriends, and just waited. And so he was flying all the way by himself. You know, they don't have the money. His father gave him money to have a videotape, and that's it. So he flied all over there. When he landed in Hong Kong, that, that's the plane that will go to the Philippines. And the uh, stewardess said, those proceeding to Paris, please get off. Those going to Manila, stay on the plane. And it just occurred to him, Paris, I could go. I could get off and go. And then he thought of me being all alone there, jilted, said, I can't do that to Loida. So he stayed on, and that's how we got married. So this is interesting. You proposed, but then you broke up with him. You broke up with him. Like, you re- you were ruthless. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, you, you left him. I, right? was, I was. And then you called him back to say, darling, let's, let's do this. Yes. He got excited. Yes. And then you start gallivanting around the world. <laughs> so he's saying, what's, what's going on? And then he gets on a plane to go, basically, go to you. Yes. And you know what he told me? You know what saved you? I was so mad with you. But you know what saved me? I received a letter from you every day. And I did. As soon as we, as soon as we knew we were getting married, a letter to him. Every day. What was it, do you believe, about you that made him go through all of the agony of having to be, be broken up with and chase you around the world? What do you think it was? And the reason why I say that is because I think that's a big question for a lot of women is, is this is a very successful, ambitious man who he could either have other women or remain single. What was it about no, no, no. No, his plan was, he planned out that he would get married at 35, be a successful, you know, success, and then marry a rich woman at 35. Oh, that was his plan. I didn't know that. Man, oh. yes, he, was, okay. he told me that. He told me that. You know what I also think it was? It's actually what you said that he would always talk about with regard to his companies. In his companies, he would say, you have to know the value. I believe you knew your value and you exhibited that through turning him down when he was trying to sleep with you early. You know, you exhibited that when you wrote him the letter to say, I'm gone. You exhibited that when you broke up with him. You exhibited that when you proposed to him, you knew your value and you exhibited that and he respected that. That was something else, you know? so, so what, one other question about the relationship. Then what are the keys to sustaining a relationship with a man that's triple, as you call him, he's not in just an A personality type. He's triple A, right? He's ultra ambitious. One of the wealthiest men, you know, who, who walk this planet. How do you sustain a happy relationship with someone like that? Aside from temper, I forgot that. The temper, oh my God, when he gets angry, blip, 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 blip. <laughs> it's like, it's like, you know, fire. You have to fire. Okay, when my mother and father would quarrel, they would quarrel like cats and dogs. Okay? It's so ugly and so painful to me as a child growing up. And in my mind, if I get married, if I get married, because I wasn't getting married, if I get married, I will never want to see that kind of scene again. Where I, blah, 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 blah. Because what's funny is that as I listen to them, my mother will say something in Filipino. My father would answer back in Filipino, but it's different. It's like, this is what she said. My father will interpret it that way. I mean, really, 
So in my mind, I'll never do it. So when we quarrel, I have to keep quiet. I mean, I don't want to answer because if, if you answer them, he'll answer. And that, you know, and that I'm so angry also in my mind, I would have tears falling. Mm. When my tears fall, then he's, he's defeated. He sees it. He sees it. And then he stops. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. You, 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 you. But, okay, this is what he said. I know what that silence is, Noida. That's aggressive silence. <laughs> Aggressive silence. Aggressive. I, think, I think I may use that line. He saw right through me. But if it's really something that bothered me, I will tell him in a quiet way. Yes. 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 I will tell him in a quiet way. You, it really feels like you balanced him. You know, we hear about that all the time, is that a relationship is really one plus one equaling more than two. That's exactly what it seems like it was between the two of you. You brought things to the table that he didn't have, that you really taught him. He brought things to the table that you didn't have, that he taught you. Love it. I love yeah, it. I learned how to watch football. <laughs> and I taught him how to enjoy musical, The Man of La Mancha, you know? Um, and I. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, um, I, I tell you, I, I, just, I just have to say this, and then I want to get to this, this last question on legacy, is your story is similar to my wife's story. Oh, really? Really? I mean, from, from the intelligence to the top of the class to the not, you know, having been in an intimate relationship before, right? There, all of those, when you were saying that story, I said, I know exactly what you're talking about. I know, I get it. So that's why I said, I think he saw your value because that's exactly what I saw in my wife. I saw someone who knew her value and never second guessed it, always exhibited it, even if that meant. I'm just not going to say anything, you know, aggressive silence. I've seen this before. Okay. All right. But when he bought Beatrice, we lived in Paris. We moved in Paris. Okay. My children are going to French school, bilingual school. I was studying French, et cetera. He would be one month in Paris, one month in New York. And in the beginning of those times, he told me, Loida, I had dinner with so-and-so. Black attractive, single, very, very, very um, well-known. She hit, reached the height in her, in her, you know, in her profession. Oh, my God. So he would leave jealousy. Oh, my Lord. I was, I was, I was hurting. I was jealous. You know, the green-eyed serpent of jealousy was there. And that's when, you know, at that time, we started a prayer group in the church, St. Joseph, the only Catholic English-speaking church in Paris. And we had a prayer group of women, you know, because women were, were prohibited. They're not allowed to work. So we come every Friday. We had faith sharing. And one of them, Nora Brady, Irish, became a good friend. And so I, I confessed to her, you know, Nora, I, I am really, 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 really very jealous because this is, I know what they're doing, but I know what he's doing. And then said, Noida, read St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, okay? Chapter 8, verse 5 to 8, or something like that. Love is patient. Love is kind. So I interpreted, okay, Noida is patient. So I stayed with that. Noida is patient. And in relation to Mr. Lewis, okay, this is what happened. I had to be picked. Love. Loida is kind. Okay? Imagine, yes. This is the situation. Loida is kind. Loida is not self seeking. Not me. You know? Loida is not proud. No. So, in, in the course of, of one whole month, I integrated that. I integrated that. It does not keep a record of wrong. All right? Does not keep a record of wrong. Love never fails. It never ends. I understood that's what love is. If you love your man, if you love, if I love him, then whether he sleeps with anyone, he can do no wrong. I love him unconditionally. Interesting. How did you then, because it seems like you inspired him to then change. Because, you know, you say that you can't change anyone. We have, we, we're the only ones who can change ourselves, right? 
But I believe that you can also inspire change. You seem to be someone who inspired, perhaps inspired change in him. Am I reading that right? That Well, all I know is that I change. I change. As I said, in my mind, it didn't bother me. He sleeps with somebody else. No, I know. Because in the end, I had to question myself. Do I love him? Of course. Does he love me? Whether he sleeps with somebody or not, does he love me? Yes, he does. So what's the, what's the problem? What's the problem? Right. Okay. So it didn't bother me if he got, yes, if he did sleep with her. But he comes back. He, he is my man. He is my man. And so that those years in Paris, I guess God was giving it to me because he would, he would be. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think he gave it to me because in five years he was gone in a short illness. And so I always say, I will always have Paris. Mm. I see. I see. I, I didn't even look at the time. Is that you're right. Paris happened, and then he sh- he passed away short shortly thereafter. Shortly thereafter, he had five years in Paris, and so they were just wonderful years. And so when I saw Pretty Woman, I said he did that. You know, he he said dress up, Loida. We're going to Venice. No, no, not Venice. We're going to um, Austria, Vienna. Vienna, yes. An orchestra on mm. New Year. In the wow. new year, yeah. So it was, it was just absolutely, you know. absolutely incredible. You, you know, M- Mrs. Lewis, I have to say this: is that I came here to interview you about how phenomenal Mr. Lewis was, right, and his legacy. And I'll walk away always knowing that he was phenomenal, and his story and his book changed my life. But I'm leaving understanding just how phenomenal you are and how integral you were to his success. And I'll say something that's very bold, and you may disagree with me on this, but I just don't believe he could have reached the heights of his success without you. But please tell us what you'd like to see the Reginald Lewis legacy be. What is it? What would you like it to see? And then also, what do you want the Loyola Lewis legacy to be? Well, you know, before he died, he wrote down the things that he wants. I guess he, I guess he knew that the, the end might come. And so he told his aunt, Beverly Cooper, these are the things I want when I have money. When the foundation, Reginald F. Lewis Foundation has money, these are the things I want. And practically, we have done it, Okay. Reginald F. Lewis International Law Center at Harvard Law School. That's three million that is funding scholarship and teachers of color. Because he said, we must, if you want to teach law and you want people of color, you must see somebody who's teaching that. So that's a fellowship that's going on. Also at Virginia State University, College of Business, is we also funded that. In the Philippines, there's the Lewis College. We funded that. And in Maryland, he had said in before he died, 1992, Museum of African American History and Culture. Okay? Five million. And so 10 years later, we see in the papers that the Baltimore legislature had allot- allotted 32 million to build a museum in Maryland of African American history and culture, same name. Yes. All right. So when when Beverly asked them, okay, Mr. Lewis was we going to give the foundation is going to give five million. What do we get? We'll name it after him. So we have a Reginald F. Lewis Museum of African American History and Culture, the largest in the East Coast, before the National Museum in Washington, DC. And now for my daughters. Okay, Leslie and Christina. Leslie is an actress and she created a one woman show of the miracle in Rwanda. So Leslie has that. And yes. Christina created. Christina, can I, I have to shout out Christina? That's, that's my girl right there. Christina, what's up, Christina? Yes, absolutely. All Star Code to Train Black and Brown. High school boys, if you want to 
bridge the gap of economic disparity, they have to be in technology. That's my daughter. For my grandchildren, I want them to have those values, the values of hard work, the values of having a goal, a destination, and the values of faith in God. Because although Mr. Lewis was a Catholic and he said he lost his faith, in the end, it was faith in God and faith in himself that propelled him. But the real legacy that I am happy to say is you. He didn't have any sons. And for you becoming successful and turning your life, that's why I have tears in my eyes, because you are his son, you are his legacy. And all those who read the book, his book, his life story, Why Should White Guys Have All the Sun? Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? They have changed their lives because they come to me. I read your husband's book and I shifted my career. I changed my life. So that's the legacy. That's why it was so important that he was writing it. He didn't finish it. That it should be finished by Blair Walker. And yeah. Wow. So, where's the book? <laughs> there it is. There it is. <laughs> Absolutely. For, for, every, for everyone listening, Mrs. Lewis is showing us the book right there. It gives me chills. Um, you know, when you said he, he didn't have sons, you know, when I look at the reviews, which are nothing but five star reviews of the book, right? It's nothing but five star reviews of the book. I see mostly black men who say the following. I felt like he was talking to me when no one else was talking to me. And that is precisely how I feel. And that's why I share it with you. I, I feel like the book is almost the secret handshake that a lot of us have. And it doesn't have to be just a black man. It could be black women. It could be white men. It could be white women who've read the book and know that the book has inspired them to the point where they've changed their life. And now it, that becomes our secret handshake. Oh, you read the book? Oh, yeah, I read the book. I, I want to say, I'll never forget my time with you today. I'll never forget it. Ever, ever. I'd mentioned this to Jill. I was trying to find a photo, the photo of me. And this is important for everyone listening to, to, to know that I wrote Mrs. Lewis a letter 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I wrote you a letter to thank you for helping to change my life because I couldn't write it to your husband. So I was writing it to you to say thank you. That was 20 years ago that I wrote you a letter. And to think 20 years later, I have this opportunity to have this discussion with you, this intimate discussion with you, is something that I will never forget. So Mrs. Lewis, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I will continue to share the story of Reginald Lewis. And from this moment on, I will continue now to share the story of Lloyd Lewis.